Good afternoon and welcome to the Connected Leadership Podcast live on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube. It's been a while since I've done a live broadcast. Uh, I had a bit of time off. Uh, I also had a a back procedure, but you don't want to know all about that. Uh, But suffice to say, we've been recording a number of interviews without the live streaming. Uh, So if you haven't caught up with some of the interviews recently, uh, there have been some really interesting ones. So go to podfollow.com forward slash Andy Lapata. You can see that under my name on the screen and catch up with a few of the podcasts that we've published over the last few weeks. Uh, So if you're a first time viewer here, here's what happens. So this is me doing my recording for my podcast, which comes out every Monday and every Thursday. We have two episodes with the same guest or guests. Uh, The Monday episode tends to be focused on a theme. And then the Thursday one is all around professional relationships uh, and the impact they've had on that guest career, as well as some resource recommendations as well. We do all of that in one recording and that's what you're tuned into now. I always need to do a time check just in case you think you're watching live, but in fact, We're already finished and we've got our feet up enjoying a hot cup of coffee uh, or cocoa or hot chocolate in my case. uh, And you're firing off questions and comments to us and we're not actually there. So your time check is it is two minutes, uh, 12 minutes past 2 p.m. on Friday, the 22nd of October. Don't let that put you off if you're listening afterwards. Post comments anyway, because myself and my guests will see those and we're happy to wade in. If you are listening live, then, uh, and I can see some of you are already, uh, pop something in the comments. If all the technology is working, it's going too well so far today. It's like when I used to play golf and my my first drive when I hadn't played for a while went perfectly. All the technology seems to be working so far. I will probably be jinxing it. But if you're watching live and I can see some people are, uh, please introduce yourself uh, in the comments, whether you're on Facebook, LinkedIn or YouTube. They should all feed through to me. Uh, Tell us where you're listening from, what brought you along here, what you want to hear today, and over the course of the conversation, uh, throw out your own experiences, your questions and so forth, and I will feed them in as I can uh, over the course of the conversation. Of course, I have to bear in mind both the experience for those of you watching live and the experience for those those listening on the podcast at a later date. So if you haven't listened to or seen uh, a, a Connected uh, Leadership podcast broadcast before. Uh, it, the premise of the podcast is that executive success is founded on our professional relationships. So that's the theme that underlies everything that we talk about. That I bring in guests from all over the world and from all types of backgrounds. And very often we will look at uh, at their career or their experiences with that theme in mind. And that's very much the case today. Uh, so Bal is, Bal is watching, a uh, regular. Hi, Bal. Great to see you here. You've, have you missed me? I'm sure you have. I, I know we've been exchanging messages elsewhere, um, but Bal is probably watches every single one of these even though I'm really bad and I don't schedule them far enough in advance so thank you for that uh, and Barry is is uh, uh, listening and watching in can't think what connection Barry has to today's podcast at all and why he would want to be here but Barry um, you are more than welcome th- th- that said a bit tongue-in-cheek if you think I'm being a bit rude and uh, the reasons may well become apparent very very shortly so let me let me set the scene for today and stop my own waffling on. Uh, My two guests today are both former police officers that I've had the pleasure to meet. Uh, I should say fortunately after they left that profession, Uh, otherwise you might wonder. Um, But they, in those roles, they've had vast experience of managing conflict so that's uh that seemed to be uh, a good idea for a theme because you know when you talk about professional re- relationships and and career development and being in a leadership role conflict is a core part of it and it's probably the the biggest obstacle to success in in, in leadership roles uh so talking to two police officers who have been really at the sharp end um seemed like a great way to to address this particular issue uh, Col Mahay is a former superintendent and a temporary chief superintendent in Derbyshire. Uh, 
And as a police officer, he experienced the Bradford riots firsthand uh, and he successfully navigated Derbyshire uh, through the national riots in 2011 without the same impact that the rest of the country felt. And that's one of the things I want to uh, address with him today. And we're also drawing joined by Laura Ash, who's a former special branch and counter-terrorism uh, officer who's, I'm sure, got fascinating tales to share, the ones that she's allowed to. What's really lovely, in, in uh, something I call small world syndrome, I, I met um, uh, Carl on a, a, a LinkedIn course, LinkedIn uh, inbound course run by our friend Sam Rathlink, uh, and I, I already knew uh, Laura and Barry, who I've just been really rude to, uh, through a totally separate course I was on. And then it turned out, I think I turned around to them both and said, you should meet each other because you've both got a similar background and you've both got similar interests now. And they turned out to, to know each other really well. So from that point, I thought, well, we've got a podcast in the making here. So hopefully that makes for a good uh, chemistry today. And just before I introduce them, I mentioned small world syndrome. Uh, and it's funny how all of those little connections happen. I, I went for a hike on Monday, just a, a short one, with my good friend and the networking uh, expert and speaker, Will Kintish. And Will has just moved from Manchester to Hertfordshire, near where I live. So we met uh, in between where we live. And Will was describing his wonderful new apartment. And then on Wednesday, which was my birthday, thank you very much, uh, I, I went out with my mum during the afternoon to the theatre and I told her about Will's new place and I described it, where it was and how Will described it to me. And my mum recognised it immediately. It turned out to be my second cousin's place, which she sold a few weeks ago to Will. So there's your small world syndrome story for today. I am waffling far too much and I am leaving my two guests sitting there ignored. And we can't have that anymore. So uh, please welcome Laura Ash and uh, Colin Hay. Thank you both for joining me. It's yeah, thank you for here. having us. How's that for a small world syndrome? Not only did the two of you know each other, but then Will ends up buying my second cousin's apartment. I could have got him a deal if I'd have known before. <laughs> I probably couldn't. I better I better say that because I know Will occasionally listens uh, to the Connected Leadership podcast. So um, welcome to you both. Thank you very much for joining me. I've been looking forward to doing this podcast for a very long time. Um, so uh, what we will do, uh, again, just to repeat for people who are listening for the first time, we are going to conduct two interviews. Uh, the first one is on this theme of managing conflict, uh, and then we'll move on to our standard questions on professional relationships after that. And they'll come out in about three weeks' time uh, on the Monday and Thursday of the second week in November. Before I go any further... Carl, Bal has just messaged. Now, I met Bal because I gave a talk uh, for HSBC's Private Bank's Balance Network. And she has just said she remembers your event for HSBC. So she's not here to, to listen to me at all. Just just to listen to you. Um, so it's Small world syndrome then. Small world syndrome. But isn't it nice when, when people remember uh, those presentations and those, those interventions uh, that impacted them? Absolutely. Right. OK, well, let's get into it. Uh, I've been waffling on for long enough. We've got plenty of people on the call. Just uh, a, a reminder, uh, as Barry has, as um, Bal has, uh, you don't have to have a name that starts with BA to contribute uh, to the discussion. So please feel free, post in the chat, post in the comments. Uh, if you're enjoying the conversation, share it on your feed as well and encourage other people uh, to join us. So let's start off. Um, We've talked about the role of strong relationships in managing uh, conflict. You've both served in the police force and in roles, as I mentioned earlier, that have brought you into direct contact with um, highly confrontational situations. Um, Carl, you, I mentioned that you were, in, you know, you, you you experienced the Bradford riots. Laura, I I know that you've experienced a lot of conflict on, on the beat, but also the, I'm sure there was a fair element of that in the counter-terrorism role and in special branch, just an element of that. So um, it would be great to see how how that's shown up in your life, uh, maybe some of the experiences that, that you uh, both experienced personally, but also witnessed around you. Uh, and particularly, you know, we all like to hear the horror stories uh, particularly this time of year, uh, but 
I think to learn, we need to know where you've seen that conflict uh, handled supremely well, whether it's by you or whether it's by other people. Um, so, Laura, let me start with you. You know, what sort of experiences did you have in the force um, where conflict was managed particularly well, and, and how did that happen? So, I spent a lot of time um, on the beat so for people listening that would be in uniform um and riding around in the emergency response vehicles which are the nice bright colors you know of the car <laughs> and within those sorts of scenarios you never quite know what you're going to get because you're just on the radio and you're ready there ready to respond so conflict i think as cool said can be just around the corner and i think the the way that you manage conflict within the police is very much down to the training that you have and you definitely have to have training in order to manage conflict whether that is within a public order setting or you just turn up to a domestic violence situation um so as i say i've got lots and lots of different stories i have seen conflict managed badly and that's when you go into a property i remember going in um with a couple of officers before and somebody is in there and they're not happy that the police are in there yeah. at all whatsoever and unfortunately some of the officers before have gone in at that higher level the same level or higher than the person that is kind of you know kicking off as we used to say and unfortunately for me that's not the way to deal with conflict you need to kind of come in a karma you need to diffuse that energy and whenever i've had conflict i've come at it from a calm place and i've come at it from a clear communication place even just using your hands and you know your um uh, your uh, your voices you know that kind of calming um situation really um but there are times when you do need to step it up and you just need to read that situation. I remember specifically one time um, we was doing a raid at seven o'clock in the morning um, on a, a place where I used to police and I was meant to be positioned out the back, which was safe. OK, and you've got all the guys rushing in the front door. And I'm out the back just in case anybody comes out. But it's like, oh, it's seven in the morning. That's not going to happen. Guess what happened? <laughs> I saw the window open and I saw the guy who, you know, obviously we was after jump out the window. Now, there's me on my own seven in the morning. You've got immediate conflict then because you've got a chase. You know, what do you do? And you have to immediately kick into action. Um, and I remember chasing him and I was kind of on my own on the radio um, kind of shouting where I was going and I saw him go up into a field and then he started to come back round and he was shouting abuse and you know um, being really quite nasty and this is going to sound ridiculous but this is what I did I hid in a bush right but I hid in the bush because I knew he was coming back my way so I thought I'll jump out and I'll grab him right? and I was thinking all the while this is you know this conflict what's going to happen here and within that moment you really had to step up take charge but you had to be calm and you had to be in control but you had to be very precise with what you were saying anyway arrested him he was still gobbing off so he had a section five warning which cool i know all about and then um, he got put in the police car um but yeah there's lots of different stories but then when i went into counter-terrorism it was different because you weren't always within that high energy it was very much about intel and creating relationships really to be honest well let's come back to that in a bit because i think obviously this is a a podcast about professional relationships so even though that might not be to the conflict theme i think that's something that, that will be worth exploring there are a couple of things i want to pick up on from what you said first of all you're in the bush, but you didn't tell us how you then arrested him. Did he run past you and everyone else arrested him? Did you jump out and go, boo? What What actually <laughs> what happened? I, 
I actually jumped out yeah. and I did pull my parvis spray because I'm on my own. Mm. You know, I'm a female. He's a lot bigger than me. Um, but yeah, I did jump out on him and, and kind of tackle him myself because everybody else was yeah. kind of like chasing after me and had no option. But yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Policing the Laura Ash way. I, I, I just, I think that's fantastic. Um, on, on a more serious note, uh, you, you talked about... Uh, needing to be not on the same level as the heightened conflict um the aggressor if you like i i, I want to ask this question without getting political about it because uh, i don't think this is the place for that but i think it's an interesting conversation from from what we're looking to discuss in america obviously there's been the big movement uh, to defund the police uh, and you know, based on, on all the experiences and all of the shootings and the impact on particular minority communities in, in the States. The defund the police, for whatever you want, is, is probably a terrible slogan, but I've listened to the arguments behind it. Uh, and one of the core arguments is that too much um, activity is undertaken by police that would be better handled by social workers, for example, uh, and and people who are trained to work specifically with mentally ill and, and so forth, and that the police are coming in in that heightened state of anticipation to deal with aggression, whereas a social worker or someone equipped to deal with, with mentally ill people would approach it from a different angle. What would be your perspective on that and, and what were your experiences of that? Is, is there a case to be made there? I think it's two very different scenarios. So when you are in the police, you are being called because there is an emergency going on straight away that you need to deal with. And when you get there, it's usually carnage. However, when you've got a social worker, and I feel when you've got um, someone that works with mental health, number one, you haven't got the stigma of being a police officer. And that can be very frightening for somebody, especially if they have got mental health issues. Yeah. Um, plus, there is a stigma around the police that a lot of people don't like the police. Yeah. And sometimes people who do have social services um, don't like the police. So I think you've got a very two very different dynamics there. The social worker would have built a relationship. Um, you know, they would have not be going into something where it's heightened and, and um, you know, fought in that situation. So I think it, it, it's kind of one peg for one and one peg for the other, if that yeah. makes sense. And I think, I mean, I'm tempted to say that obviously that's a movement in the States and policing here and policing in the US will be very different. And then you look at what happened with the, the former footballer, Dalian Atkinson, um, where he was he, he was killed by two police officers when he was having a mental breakdown. Um, now, again, I'm not passing comment on that, but it, obviously that would be a, a, a case where that argument would be put forward, I'm sure. Um Carl, let, let's bring you into this, the conversation on this point. Uh, have you seen uh, occasions where conflict has been maybe handled the wrong way because it's the wrong people or, or the wrong mindset where people are, are, are coming in? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I don't think you can be in a job like the police service and, and not see this kind of stuff, Andy. Um, at the end of the day, police officers are just human beings. And as well trained as we are to cope with any eventuality, and we, you know, one of the things I guess police officers have always got to be is ready, ready to adjust to the, sh the shifting circumstances. And you literally don't know what's around the next corner. Sometimes you have to respond at, from this level. Sometimes you have to bring it down. And you just have to be that level of, um, you know, um, that level of prepared and that level of being able to adjust your style. Now, you know, as you know, emotional intelligence is my thing. This is what uh, you know I'm passionate about, and I go into all sorts of organisations and teach emotional intelligence and leadership. But one of the fundamental things about emotional intelligence is about understanding your social context or the environment in which you're in, and then building relationships. Now, those are two very, very important parts of emotional intelligence. And I've been in many situations in the police service and beyond the police service, to be quite honest. Um, I've been in many situations where I've seen a colleague who has approached something with the pure technical training that they've got, whether it's self-defense, whether it's the legal precedent that they might have, the legal authority, and they've relied purely on that. And then are surprised 
why the situation seems to have gone out of control. So, I, I mean, a good example of this would be, I remember when I was a very, very young uh, police officer and um, I was maybe nine stone wet through, you know, I was a really young lad. I wish I could sort of uh, regain some of that slimness now. <laughs> Um, but uh, we got called, my, my, my colleague and I got called to a, a, a man causing a disturbance on the street. So it was a hot summer's day. We pulled up down the street in our police car. And sure enough, there was this huge titan of a man uh, stripped, down to his, uh, stripped down to his jeans, uh, bare chested, a huge tattoo on his back. I'll never forget that huge tattoo on his back and his back was literally like this it was like you know it was like a muscle man and i was like wow he's a big boy my friend uh, got out of the car and this man was walking around shouting and what had happened was that the postman had come and he'd attacked the postman the truth of it was that this man had mental illness and didn't know what he was doing and he saw the postman as being someone who had come to uh, attack him so all the neighbors were down one end of the street and he was uh, waving his shirt around and shouting loudly. And we were the only two police officers there. And as we approached him, I'm there trying to calm him down and trying to find out his first name and tell him my first name and talk to him at a different level. Whereas my friend had already got his handcuffs out. It was in those days where we had old fashioned handcuffs and the handcuffs were in a little pouch on your belt. Not quite the equipment that modern police officers have. We didn't have CS gas. So we had a little wooden stick in, in a hidden pocket, a secret pocket in our trousers called a truncheon. I've got it on the, on the wall now to remind me of those halcyon days. And uh, my friend got out. He had his truncheon in his hand. He had his handcuffs in the other hand. And, um, I mean, he wasn't a big chap himself, my friend. Uh, and he went up to this chap and he whacked one of the handcuffs on the wrist. All hell broke loose. He literally lifted my friend up and he was waving him around in the air. This, this is how big this guy was. I'm trying to hold his other hand down, but he's dragging me along with him. So I thought, this is all wrong. And I said to my friend, release him from the handcuffs and actually walk away. Let me talk to him. And we ended up having a chat and we ended up, you know, swapping first names. And I told him, you know, this is like my first year in policing. I really don't know what's going on. I'm learning all the time. And maybe I want to learn from him too. Eventually, he says to me, come into my house, and uh, he took me into his house, and we sat in his living room, and I could see that he was very agitated, but he was beginning to calm down, but I knew that one wrong word from me would have sent him over the edge again. We ended up um, having half an hour together, and I'd radioed to my friend and said, look, everything's fine. If, if things aren't well, I'll press the button uh, for you to come in uh, to assist me, and we ended up having half an hour of conversation, a half an hour where I learned to his learned of his woes his troubles his failed relationship and all the things that were bothering him and why the postman was seen as such a threat etc etc and i said to him look we're gonna to have to go to the police station we're gonna to have to try and sort this out for you and maybe even get you the help that you need um because clearly you've got nobody here to help you and you know what half an hour later this man who calmed right down we got into a police car i got in with him and we and we drove down to the police station he didn't want to talk to my friend ever again uh, so a different police officer had to drive us back so there for me is an example of how emotional intelligence, i.e. building trust, building relationships, changing your language and your style and your demeanor to match the other person, uh, what they call in NLP, you know, uh, mirror matching. Yeah. Uh, all of these kind of things, I built a rapport with this individual. Now, I do this in business all the time. I do this when I teach my leadership stuff. And, you know, one of the things that's going on in society right now is something called the Great Resignation. So since lockdown, we're seeing masses of people resigning from organizations because uh, of all the things that emotional intelligence is uh, and what they're not experiencing in their own workplaces, i.e. not feeling trusted, not feeling valued, not feeling uh, connected with. You know, it's, it's great that your podcast is called Connected Leadership. Yeah. I think emotional intelligence is all about connected leadership. And in policing, it was all, always about connected being connected with the other individual, being connected with our communities, being connected with, uh, you know, people that you meet on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and that for me is, is not complex. It, it really isn't complex, but some people make it really scientific um, and, you know, talk in big language, fancy language about what it is and why it isn't. But really it is about trying to see things from the other person's perspective and trying to build that link. 
And I've seen that time and time and time again in all the conflicts that I've ever seen in the police service and outside of the police service. I, I think that's a great way of, of summarising it. Um, I, I have a similar experience. Just before I share that, Sarah Ring is, is uh, watching on Facebook and says good afternoon all. So thanks for tuning in, Sarah. If anyone watching has any comments or questions, please feel free to feed them into the chat uh, and I'll bring them in as and when I can through the conversation. So, so my experience of that, and I hadn't really thought about it in terms of this, this conversation until you said that, Carl. Um, I, probably not a lot of people know this, uh, but I started my career post-university in the civil service. Um, and I, I was in the glamorous roles. My, my first two years, I was a tax collector. Uh, and my next two years, I was a, a social fund officer in the benefits agency. So I was, in, I, I was introduced to conflict at, a, at an early stage as well. And, you know, particularly, you know, as a tax, with the tax side, I was, I was dealing with small businesses and that was fine i don't think i ever really had any fear for, for any in any case in the social fund role i mean i had to get smuggled out of the office to the station in the back of someone's car with jackets over me um after someone who'd already served time for walking into the unemployment office with a sawn off uh started threatening me and but i had staff who lived on the estates where uh the claimants were living i at least i i was commuting an hour and a half uh to get there so i could get away uh, but exactly what you say, uh, there were times when people would come in raging and my colleagues on reception were just heroes because they put up with everything. And you'll have seen this, I'm sure both of you, the, the reception supervisor that from that day is still a close friend of mine uh, and her team were just brilliant. Uh, and then often that Juliet would turn around and say to me, um, Andy, we'd really like you to see this person, even though they didn't qualify to for, for a meeting with me. Uh, and I would, you know, I would always take her lead. And when they sat down with me, they were as good as gold. And all people wanted was to be heard. Mm. And it was really interesting hearing that, that difference between your colleague coming out with the truncheon and cuffs and you coming out with two ears and a voice and just the balance between the two it just reminds me of that time and sometimes when someone's raging at you it's not about mirroring where they're at it's about bringing them to a different space by being um by 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 engaging in a different way emotionally Absolutely. to where they are yeah. i mean one of the things i very often think about is how our brains are working at, in mm. that moment so um, there's a great book on this called The Chimp Paradox. Yes, uh, yes. Steve, Peters. Steve Peters. Yeah. Um, but in, in very basic language, you know, we have to look at two aspects of our brain, the limbic aspect and what they call the prefrontal cortex, you know, where, where the forehead is. That's the rational part yeah. of our brain. Uh, and the limbic part is the emotional part of our brain. So when we're in a high stress situation and we have to make a decision and we have to deal with something that's in front of us, uh, all of our information that comes into our body goes straight to the limbic brain first and foremost. It's the fastest part of our brain. It's the oldest part of our brain. Sometimes they call it the reptilian brain. Yeah. But it's also the part of the brain that also has a fear receptors in them, two tiny little things called the amygdala. The amygdala make a decision. Is this thing a threat to me? If it is, let me activate different parts of my brain to make sure that I can fight, flight or freeze. But unless we engage the rational part of our brain, we're never going to make uh, objective decisions. We're not going to make rational, clear decisions. We'll end up fighting and flighting all over the place without any clear idea of what we're doing. So I found that in many of the conflicts that I ever was involved in, whether it's police officers or whether it's uh, riots, you know, I used to be a match commander, so I've seen plenty of football disorder. And, you know, we saw it a couple of weeks ago with the yeah. hungry versus... Uh, England and I've got so many views on what what happened to the police there uh, because I was one of those police officers. Uh, what you see is people who ordinarily could be professional people doing very sensible jobs. They come into the football environment, suddenly they turn into these animals almost. Uh, they turn into this group dynamic. They, they, they get sucked up into the group dynamic and they're completely led by the Olympic brain. And that can be the same for the police officers, too. You can see police officers and you talked about some of the things that happen in America, but they happen here as well. They happen yeah. all over the world. 
it's when simply when people don't engage their rational brain and they go off with, just with a limbic brain so the fight flight or freeze could end up being i need to shoot this person because i think they're a threat whether they're a threat or not is a different matter well let, let's uh, just to say on steve peters by the way chimp paradox has been recommended on here a number of times uh, Steve Peters and I spoke at the same conference last week funnily enough um, and I also there's a, a there's an interview on the podcast archive with Paul McGee who wrote Sumo very much on, on, on a similar model and I, I know I introduced Paul to, to Laura and Barry and he's been on your podcast as well um, uh, and, and so I'd recommend you know for, to go deeper on this listen to read the chimp paradox read Sumo listen to the podcast with Paul uh, there's so much there um, to pick to pick up on uh, a couple of things in the chat Bow says so important to, to listen Barry says the red mist sets in uh, mm. you know picking up on the on the limbic system I think right rather than anything Laura's said. Um, uh, as one of those football supporters, you know, through the 80s and 90s, I was going uh, to football matches all over the UK and beyond. I think it worked both ways. Uh, and this leads on to my next question, because you talk about the animal behaviour, animal instinct and herd instinct to the football fans. But as one of those professionals who was perfectly respectable in every other walk of life, I was treated like an animal by police forces, particularly at the height of um, the hooliganism in the, in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, there were certain forces that were worse than others. But I can remember coming off trains, being herded into groups, um, not being allowed to you know, it was kettling before kettling became a word, you know, we all knew. Um, and you would try and talk to the police and they wouldn't engage. Uh, so I think it very much goes both ways and it goes to our conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Of, and, yeah. you know, I'll hold my hands up, Andy. I mean, I've been a public order commander mm. for best part of two decades and, and then a match commander. And I've been that commander that has mm. held people in abeyance uh, until we managed to um, understand and fine-tune our policing around uh, football matches, we eventually got it to a point where it became intelligence-led. Yeah. And the people that we needed to hold in one position and crocodile back to the stadium were the 200-odd that were yeah. de you know, determined to have uh, some kind of violent interaction rather than the 30,000 uh, peaceful yeah. fans. Uh, but I think people, the police service needed to go through that transition because... You may remember from the in the 80s, you know, I was around in the 80s in policing. Uh, the way that we managed football matches was awful. Yeah. You know, we had violence every single weekend at football matches. Uh, whereas if you compare that to the 2000s, we very rarely had violence at football matches. So we had to go through that transition period where I think it started off with this fight or flight. Uh, that we thought that's the only way we're going to do it. These are the technical skills. And then we realized, actually, there's a bit more than technical skills. We need the emotional intelligence skills yeah. and we need the community intelligence skills as well uh, around football. And that's when, you know, I think this country has probably got one of the best um, responses to football policing than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. At the moment. And I've got a theory on, on when the change came. Uh, and I think it ties in with what l we're going to talk to Laura about in terms of uh, her role in counter-terrorism. So let me come back to you about emotional intelligence in the police for force, which I want to do. But let's look at that, because, Laura, you said that in your counter-terrorism role, it was much less about conflict and much more about information gathering and relationship building. Um, what Collar's just outlined in terms of that shift in the policing of public disorder at football matches I noticed um, that there became a time, as a regular away fan back then, where the the local police force to our, our club, Charlton, had a liaison officer who came to the games, home and away. Now, I was running, back in 1990, I was running the train travel for away fans. So I got to know him really well. And he was a great guy and we got on really well, but it wasn't just me in that capacity. All the supporters knew him. And now I've moved away from that scene a little bit now um, but I know that those liaison officers are still there and it's not just the volunteers like myself uh, I was supporters club committee at the time it's not just the volunteers like myself that um, are engaging with those liaison officers it's the um, 
I'm, I'm trying to think of the right term to use without offending anyone or, or, or soft uh, catching it, but it's the, the those more likely to engage in disorder. That's that's, that's a, the the, the politic way, the, the diplomatic way to put it. So they're engaging with the police and they know them by their first name and so forth. So they've got that intelligence. They've got that relationship. The, 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 the police officer can let the... Um, not only let the hosting force at away games know who to look out for, but they'll travel with them and they'll please the away fans themselves. So that's the relationships and intelligence gathering that you were talking about, Laura, isn't it? How, how, mm. Tell us more about the, you know, how that worked in your role in, in counterterrorism. So when I moved over to counterterrorism, um, I was part of an operation um, that was looking at creating relationships within the local community. Because in my time in counterterrorism, we were very much dealing within my role with the threat of ISIS. So we'd had 9-11 and the big threat was radicalization from within the UK. So my role was very much to liaise with mosques liaise with youth groups, liaise with immigration, liaise with social services to highlight any individuals that could be vulnerable to radicalization because we'd had the shoe bomber, we'd had the giraffe um, cafe bomb, uh, which were both horrendous things. And those guys were actually, you know, radicalized from within their bedroom. So very much for me, it was about building those relationships with those agencies, but then also meeting with, you know, sort of people from that kind of background as well to understand more about the religion and, you know, the way that they they think and they act each day, because it's a completely different culture than what I'm, you know, used to. So, And then from there, I then moved into domestic extremism, which is where you're looking at things like animal rights. Um, We're looking at, you know, EDL, people like that. Again, you know, football stuff. And I think one of the most powerful things within the police force is gathering intelligence. And to gather intelligence, you have to have good relationships with people in the community, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's community leaders or whether it is whether you're dealing with, you know, Um, what they call cheers human resources um do you know what i mean so it's so powerful and so impactive as well just just for anyone who doesn't know who's listening edl is the english defense league which is uh white nationalism uh basically Mm -hmm. putting it in very simple terms um so and i'm very much mindful of the interesting stories having a practical purpose and again i think this is a good example where you you have people who um come into a role or you come into a new role they're skeptical of you they don't trust you they think you've got your own agenda when you're trying to engage with communities that feel ignored they feel under attack um as a lot of the communities you needed to build that relationship with would have been how did you overcome that initial scepticism, that defensiveness, um, that fear of going against their community, I guess, by opening up to you um, to build the relationships that you needed? Do you know what? It's as simple as just sitting and listening. It, it really is as simple as that. And it's just sitting and it's listening. And if they have had a complaint about stuff that's happened before, you just sit and you just listen. And, and it... I, I, it sounds really simple, but that is all that you do. Because upon that, upon you listening, upon you, you know, really paying attention to that person and understanding them from their point of view, as, as Cole said, you have to put yourself in that other people's shoes. That then starts to build a relationship, build trust. And you can't build these things overnight. You know that, Andy, from, you know, stuff that that, um, that you do. And it is literally just slowly, slowly. And just, you know, checking in, how are things going? If you notice that maybe it's um, um, an important date in the calendar, you have a chat with them. Is there anything that we can do to help you with, you know, anything at all whatsoever? Um, And it is literally just about listening and building that rapport through that way. Yeah, I I think I think there's a there's a it reminds me of an old Punjabi saying, which I'm going to just try and translate. It says to say it is simple to do it is hard. Uh, And and what Laura's talking about there, this this art of listening, it it is that simple. It is that level of simple. 
but actually it is an art form in its own right you know that is emotional yeah. intelligence in practice for me and mm. try as they might there was a lot of my colleagues that really struggled to do that they really struggle to connect with people at that deeper level you know with all the strategic partnerships that i was involved in where people used to say oh these other organizations aren't as good as the police service they don't think like us they don't talk like us and i thought isn't that great because that's cognitive diversity what we yeah. need to do is learn how to listen to them and learn how collectively we can achieve a common goal you know i was a director of intelligence so i've done quite a bit of work that uh, laura was involved in as well and building those community relationships is so critical because what happens is not only do the the satisfaction and the confidence in from your local community in your into your police force increase but what also happens is you start getting community intelligence and you can take this right back to when i was a street cop walking around the beat i'd, I'd chat with a guy who five o'clock every morning behind the shops he'd be burning all the rubbish from all the shops i'd sit and have half an hour with him because the stuff that he knew was incredible when I came into work and I was running my department, I always came in half an hour early. Why? Just so I could talk to the cleaners at work because the stuff that they knew was incredible. That's intelligence. But you only build that two-way communication by sitting and listening and really actively listening, as Laura talked about. And it really is that level of simple. But the art of emotional intelligence and building relationships is, is not something that you build overnight. You have to learn that. Yeah. You have to practice and you have to be conscious. I'm very aware on a listening basis of, of my tendency to um, immediately turn it to me, you know, what my experience is and so forth. And just the ability to leave that pause at the end and, and digest what someone said. Yeah. Hosting a podcast when you're trying to do everything else and listen so that you can respond to what's being said is great training uh, for it. Might not be what everyone wants to do in order to practice, but it is very good practice for it. If... Um, I interviewed, okay, so obviously I'm very conscious that I'm I'm doing a live broadcast and this is going out on the podcast in about three weeks. So for those watching live, I interviewed yesterday. For those um, listening to the podcast, um, on the podcast about three weeks ago or two weeks ago, we had Mark Hirschberg. So that interview took place yesterday and Mark shared some really good tips on listening skills so that's the the episode on the career toolkit that um will be or was on the podcast around the 25th of october um so uh well you know you've talked a lot about emotional intelligence uh colin while i haven't uh given the title um uh, of emotional intelligence to the podcast when you're managing conflict it's it's core uh, to, to the way that you approach it clearly we've talked a lot about changes in the police force now from our conversations both when we originally met and uh, and in the build-up to this um i think you came into the police around the mid 80s if i if i'm right around the time of the miners uh, uh strike so yeah. let me ask you this question and it might be an unfair question if it is just uh, tell me uh but i think it would be a really interesting one is the, the is the police in the UK emotionally intelligent now? And was you know what has the change been since you you originally joined the force in the mid eighties? That is a tough question, but I mean, what I will say is this: uh, diplomatic as ever, I think the police service is more emotionally intelligent now than the police service I joined in the early eighties. Um, I think it. It's, it's beginning to grow and beginning to recognize the importance of what we traditionally used to call soft skills and understanding that these soft skills are, are very important. I think it goes way beyond the police service. I think this is in every organization, particularly across our public sector, because in our public sector here in the UK, we tend to have a very bureaucratic approach to the way that we make decisions. And that includes the police service. Uh, I think we need to lessen that a bit more and make it much more emotionally intelligent and and, and, and more sort of intuitive. I, I look at what how police officers talk now, you know, there's more police officers on social media than there was in my day. And that was only seven years ago. I listen to the language that they use and it's it's much more different than the kind of language that we were allowed to use. So that I find that encouraging, but these is like a tiny percentage of all the police officers across the United Kingdom. I, I genuinely believe um, 
that we need to do a wholesale piece of work across the police service, across the fire service, across the uniformed services, because they tend to have a very hierarchical approach to leadership anyway. I think we need to do it across the public sector. I think we need to have a very um, uh, wide scale, wide sweeping approach to understanding how we can embed emotional intelligence into our cultures in our organizations. And I wrote an article on LinkedIn only a few weeks ago where, where, I stopped, where I said, you need to stop chasing diversity and start changing your culture. What I meant by that was all of these organizations tend to be very performance led. And so if you give them a performance target of you need to have X percentage of this, this grouping within your organization, they'll chase that target, but it doesn't mean that they're changing the organization. What I call demographic diversity, i.e. different colors and different genders and different orientations, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to change the organization because if you hire 10 black people, but they've all been to the same school that you went to, they all live in the same area that you live in, they all have the same kind of families, eat the same kind of food, play the same kind of sport that you play, their chances are that their thought process is going to be very similar to yours. So you're just going to create that echo chamber. So true diversity for me is cognitive diversity, where you welcome people who have different ways of thinking, different thoughts, but you're never going to do that if you have a culture that is that is not emotionally intelligent. And I think that's why we have so many people leaving so many organizations over the last 12 months. Organizations need to shift. I think the real challenge and the new challenge for leaders from here on in is to become much more empathic, much more trusting, much more uh, able to listen to people, much more able to connect with people and understand that true diversity means literally everybody is different. People have mental illnesses. People have um, come from different cultures. People are single parents, all of these kind of things. We're made up of this beautiful sort of diversity of people. And if we're going to get the best out of them, we need to allow them to speak from their own position and, and contribute to the overall um, sort of discussion. Barry said on, on Facebook, love this, call," And uh, I, I agree. I think that, well, regular listeners to, to the podcast will know that I, I bang on about cognitive diversity a lot on here. I think it's so important. Where you talk about um, don't um, stop chasing diversity and start changing your culture. The, one other thing I've mentioned a few times on the podcast, and we've covered this as well, is that people focused on the diversity in DNI and not enough on inclusion. 100%. And I think what you're talking about there is more around inclu the, the inclusion element. Let's assume you've got the diversity in place, but you need to get the inclusion uh, in, into place as well, which is absolutely I, key. I think if you if we shifted, shifted the focus and focused in on inclusion, yeah. diversity will look after itself because then you become an employer of choice. Then you start seeing... Uh, having all of these diverse people looking into your organization and say, hey, I'd love to be in that organization. Mm. It's a bit like, you know, people look at Google and say, wow, I'd love to be a part of Google because Google's got this incredible reputation. It's that that we need to create in all of our organizations. So just to let people sort of in behind the scenes a little bit, uh, when we prepare for a podcast, I'll normally prepare six or seven questions uh, with the understanding that we might not use them all and we might go off in different directions. For today, I only prepared four because I felt that there would be enough um, to just let the conversation flow. I've only asked one of those questions so far and we're, we're, we're on about 40 minutes out of 45. So <laughs> I, I was, I was pretty, pretty accurate in terms of my prediction that the conversation would flow. Because obviously if you don't prepare enough com questions, you get a bit nervous that you'll run out of something to talk about. I don't think that's a risk. Um, so there is one of those questions that I do want to explore because I think it's important. I think it will impact a lot of people who listen to this podcast in one form or another. We started off by talking about uh, how you experience and respond to conflict in your role when you were both in the police force. But I know, um, you know, that those conflicts were external. I know from our respective conversations that you both experienced conflict internally inside the police force and that's something that as someone who's not uh, and has never been in the police force my guide on this is tv drama 
where you always see this conflict played out in some form or another. In any police drama, there's internal conflict in the police force. Um, but let's have a let's have a, a dose of reality. I mean, I don't know how true to life they are, um, but it would be great to hear a little bit about what you've been through or what you went through when you were in the police and how you handled it then and how you might handle it now if, if it would be any differently with the benefit of hindsight. So, Laura, a lot of your conflicts were around uh, mental health issues that you, you, you've had and you, you have and you've spoken out uh, openly about. Um, so can you just share a little bit about what you went through uh, and how, how you handled it? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I don't watch any like police drama <laughs> because it just winds me up. <laughs> it just winds me up. Um, have, I had a very mixed bag um, while I was in the police. So while I was in the police, I was diagnosed with bipolar and OCD. And that is what eventually led to my um, medical retirement. Now, just like with any organisation, I had amazing guardian angel officers who were absolutely behind me and beside me. Unfortunately, some of the conflict that came did come from higher up officers that I respected Um, you know comments like it's such a shame what happened to you because you showed good promise of being a good police officer now when you are going through a diagnosis and really trying to discover yourself with this really quite destroying um, potential of a, a, um, a condition and especially where you look up to that person that really, really made me very angry and very bitter for quite a few years. And it affected me within uh, Rock Solid as well, because I was like, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I'm, I'm not very good. But then emotional intelligence, I started to look at, right, why did they say that? Clearly, the training of higher officers has not was not there in that time when I was in the police force. It was not you know, highly known. I was told not to talk about my mental health because it made other people feel uncomfortable. Again, that came from somebody a bit higher. But the troops on the ground who were with me, um, and yes, some, you know, higher, they were fantastic with me. They were absolutely brilliant. They understood if I needed to take some time or whatever. So I've kind of had both of them, but I've, I did initially take it as a personal attack at me. But I think really what it was is just there was just a not a very good understanding by those officers. And why would there be? Because back, you know, in those days, it wasn't really spoken about mental health like yeah. it is now. Um, and I would imagine it would be handled very differently um, now. But I was very fortunate in it was one of my sergeants that actually noticed that something wasn't right and asked me to go to the doctors. So there's very much a mixed bag there like there is in any um, uh, any organisation. And, and Cole, for you, I mean, coming into uh, the police force in the mid 80s, you, you were going to come, you know, you're going to experience uh, racial prejudice within the force. It's again, I, I only know what I know th- second, third hand. Um, but th- the police certainly at that period was notorious for um, racial prejudice. Uh, was that your experience? How did you handle it? How did you get through it? And when you were in a, a senior leadership role, what did you do to to change that culture? Great question. But first, can I say to Laura, you know, fantastic story, Laura. Every time you tell me that story, you know, I'm blown away by it. And, you know, I'm also saddened that the police service at a very senior level can't get their heads around the emotional connection and why it's so important to look after your staff and have honest and open conversations yeah. rather than just hide behind policies and practices and procedures because that's what tends to happen you know when i was head of a department the amount of times i had somebody who was on long-term sick leave with a legitimate illness like cancer or something like that and at six months uh, hr used to say well we're going to put them on half half pay and i was like no we need to have a conversation first don't just automatically do these things uh, i want to have a conversation as to why they need to go on half pay and whether they they can come back to work. You know, I even had people working from home just half a day a week just so I can keep them on the record as being on full pay. And I think we need to move away from this like, oh, such a stringent way of doing things. We need to be more human uh, about everything. 
And, and you're right, Andy, you know, when I joined the police service in the early 80s, I, I literally was a brown speck in a sea of white. You know, I, I, that's the best way I can describe it. And not just that, I went from living in a very multicultural city in Wolverhampton and I moved to the, the wilds of Derbyshire where I thought I'd gone colorblind. I saw more green than I'd ever seen before. And, uh, and, more, and I thought, you know, cows were solitary animals. They were actually in herds and things <laughs> like that, you know. So it was a culture shock to, for me in so many different ways. And of course, you know, we lived through the miners' strike in my first year and all of the things that I saw with that. And yes, you know, I'd, I'd be lying to say that I didn't experience overt racism and, uh, um, and prejudice, you know, right throughout my service. I've seen it to some degree or another. I felt alone and I felt excluded. I, I remember going to my first police station and I'm being forced to stand outside the police station so they could uh, take a photo for the local press. And, yeah. you know, I was front page in the local press as the first black officer to come to Swaddling Code, which is the town that I was in. And I remember Edwina Curry MP, who was our local MP, sends me a handwritten letter welcoming me to the town. And I remember thinking, I wonder if she does that for all police officers, because that's all I am. I just saw myself as a police officer, not as a black or brown police officer. Um, but as time went on, I, 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 you know, you know, we get back into the limbic brain. I saw people of my color or female uh, officers. Uh, simply throwing the towel in or getting angry and taking the organization to court. Now, my experience is that the vast majority of the people I worked with were good people. They were genuinely good people who wanted to do a good job. And they might they might have been ignorant, but I wouldn't say they were prejudiced. They were they literally didn't know. So there's a lot of education that I could have done with them. And that, of course, is about building relationships. So they get to understand me and I get to understand them, etc. Um, so I saw a lot of people who were going through a similar experience and they went, they had a limbic response. They either, you know, upped and left the organization or they took the organization to court and they were bitter and twisted forevermore. I just don't think that that's the healthy way of dealing with it. A, it doesn't resolve the situation and B, nobody really survives that kind of, that, that kind of experience. So for me, I always ask myself the question, how can I change this? How can I influence this, this culture? And I very often say that you, you shouldn't look at your, there's the circle of concern and there's a circle of influence or control. You can't worry about the circle of concern all the time. You know, if you spent all your life worrying about all the things that you've got no control over, you'd never get a, a proper night's sleep and you'd make yourself ill. So I looked at what could I influence? How could I influence? And I started understanding that there were other black and Asian officers around my force in different police stations. Uh, I started meeting up with them. I remember we used to have secret meetings in each other's houses because it was in those in, in that era that if two black officers were seen in a police station talking to each other in a corridor, people would stare. You know, they would be wondering what on earth are they discussing? What are they planning, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we were acutely aware of that. So we started meeting in each other's houses and we started forming an informal network. That network became stronger and stronger, and we knew that this was being happening. This was being done in other police forces as well. We started talking to those other police forces as well, and consequently, uh, we eventually created what we what is now called the Black Police Association. And ironically, uh, they've just had the National Black Police Association uh, AGM, which finished today, I understand, in Bedfordshire. Um, such was the the case that uh, I became chair of the local Derbyshire Black Police Association. But in 1998, I became vice president of the National Black Police Association. Um, this was the first proper full year of the NBPA. And I was here I was as the, as the vice president. Here's me, a little lad from Derbyshire, having to travel down to London once a week. And I ended up meeting with successive home secretaries on a one to one, you know, Jack Straw and David Blunkett. We ended up being at, and I sat on the Stephen Lawrence board and I read the Lawrence inquiry report, McPherson report when it came out, uh, when it was embargoed. I remember talking to chief constables up and down the country about how they need to shape policing. I remember being involved in setting targets for uh, recruitment, retention and progression of uh, black officers. And there were times when I had to pinch myself and say, I'm still that young, you know, I was an inspector, then a young inspector from Dobson, I'm doing all of this now. So when you're focusing on your circle of influence, you realize that you can expand that and eventually you can impact on your circle of concern is the point that I'm trying to make. So when 
I was a very reluctant person, a reluctant leader in the police service. I, I did 10 years as a constable. I didn't want to do anything else, but somebody said to me, you really owe it to yourself and owe it to others to start getting promoted. So as I got to you know leadership levels and I started to realize I can influence things, I decided that's the way I'm going to change the culture. So my last eight or nine years were dedicated at superintendent level, senior level, and wherever I went, and I managed a lot of departments from, you know, from crime support, like um, surveillance and drug squad, right through to uh, corporate services and contact management centers and learning and development and operations. And wherever I went, I wanted to carry my style of emotional intelligence leadership through. And I didn't really focus in on the race issue or the female issue or the sexual orientation issue. I focused in on inclusive leadership uh, because I wanted to prove the point that if you create inclusive cultures, you will have no problems in creating diversity within those cultures. Carl, that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both for your stories there. Uh, I love that uh, circle of in influence versus circle of concern. I think that's incredibly powerful and a very practical tool as well. In other words, deal with what you can deal with mm -hmm. and, and don't lose your, waste your energy on everything else. Um, Neil Giller is- find, Andy, sorry, that yeah. mo most of the solutions to life are the kind of things that your parents would probably say to you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they are simple adages and there's yeah. a lot to be said in all of the, the, the quotes that we hear from way back when, you know, it's the kind of thing my mum would say, don't worry about yeah. what you can't, can't change, just worry about what you can change and that's it. I say I will go and tidy my room after this. Uh, <laughs> uh, going back to, to your response to Laura's um, comments, Neil Giller has said it's time to be more human. Uh, and Wendy Walsh has said um, she agrees we need to do things more humanly. Um, and, and Wendy's just moved job and, and moved from uh, Washington, I think, to Texas, if I remember that rightly. So I hope the move went well, Wendy, and thanks for joining us. Hopefully a future guest on the podcast. Uh, and Bala said thank you as well. I think that, that those comments about it's time to be more human in reaction to, to Laura's uh, experiences have really struck a chord with people um, joining us on the, on, on the broadcast. Uh, okay, so I don't normally do this, uh, but we have spent uh, our time talking about your experiences in the police force. You're both, you've both been out of the force for, for a while. Cole, you've shared a lot about what you're doing in terms of working with leaders, in terms of emotional intelligence. Um, Laura, I love what you and Barry do with Rock Solid. You know I'm a massive fan, uh, but you haven't told anyone what that is, and I think it would be only fair uh, to invite you to do so. So can you just share a little bit about Rock Solid and why you're so wonderful? <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, yes, um, we own a company called Rock Solid Health and we help people to live healthier and happier lives. Um, and everything that we do in Rock Solid has actually come out of crisis um, from what we went through. Um, and we realised that the fundamentals for people living a happy and healthy life is by looking after the six pillars of health. You know, sleep, water, nutrition, movement, uh, thought management and de-stress me time um, and we work with people who you know lots of different ranges from people who are teachers and trainers all the way up to people that are CEOs and um, business owners working within burnout as well yeah. but it's our absolute mission just to help people create happier healthier lives so they can live longer and enjoy life. And I knew that I could bring you in to talk about the impact of health and well-being on how we engage with people. Um, but I really wanted to, 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 to go down this road. Um, but would it be fair to say on this theme that if you're if you're healthy, if you're rested, if you're mentally focused, uh, conflict is going to happen less often and be easier to navigate and respond to? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, even if we haven't slept... You know, we have a hormone called adenosine, which will kind of um, accumulate over the day. And if we haven't had enough time to sleep at night, it's only sleep that enables us to get rid of that. We wake up the next morning and we feel anxious. And when we haven't slept, we're more emotionally vulnerable. OK, we're more mentally vulnerable and we're going to make bad decisions and we are not going to be our best. 
And so by fueling our bodies, by understanding, you know, the thinking mind, being rested, moving your body, you really are able to step into that true leader and really embrace your passion for life and go for it at a much, much higher level. And, and Barry, who is your partner in crime, who I was so rude to at the beginning of, of the show, has, has uh, added better mental resistance and, and resilience as comments. Uh, and I think that all goes together. And just to bring everything full circle, uh, you both started out in sharing your stories uh, of conflict in the force by talking about how some of your colleagues would respond uh, viscerally if you like, emotionally um, to the conflict rather than in that um, uh, considered thoughtful way that really takes the edge off of the conflict. And Carl, you shared the story of um, your, your colleague dragging out the, the handcuffs and truncheon and you, you just talking. Uh, and obviously the, the less sleep you have, the less rested you are, the more your limbic brain, your, your chimp is going to jump into action. Um, so but yeah. But Andy, on that as well, you know, very, very quickly, because I know we're, we're strapped for time. But if we were able to just check in with people first thing in the morning for briefing, how are you doing? What's going on at home? I've had an argument with wife. OK, maybe not the best person to send out to, you know, a 999 or something yeah. if they're not going to be able to handle their self in the best manner for the other people to keep that situation safe. And that transfers through to any role. You know, one of the things that I've been yeah. saying to people when I've been doing sessions on uh, building relationships when you're socially distanced, and that includes with your own team, is don't just pick up, uh, get on Zoom calls or Teams calls with your team around agendas, but pick up the phone to them individually and say, how are you doing? How's everyone in the house? How are you coping with lockdowns and so forth? And it's the same principle. Just check in with people and know where your team are because just as you don't want to send out a highly stressed, exhausted police officer at a 999 call, you don't want to send a, a highly stressed, um, exhausted executive on a customer call or uh, whatever it might be. It might have slightly less uh, damaging repercussions, but as a leader, there's still re repercussions you want to avoid anyway. Um, Carla and, and Laura, for people listening, thank you for engaging. Stay on because we're going to carry on and we're going to record our Thursday podcast. Um, but certainly for, for, the, for this, we, we have overrun our normal time, but it was worth it. And I'm sure people will stay gripped. Thank you very much for being guests on the Connected Leadership Podcast. Oh, thank you so much. It's been amazing. And thank you, Cole, for allowing me to spare this, share this space with you. You've got a mute, Cole. You've muted yourself. And <laughs> we're not even doing it on Zoom or Teams. Oh, how did I do that? <laughs> thank you so much, Andy. It's been a huge pleasure and always great to share space with uh, Loz. Fantastic. OK, are you both happy to crack straight on with the, the uh, Thursday podcast? Do you need a quick mm -hmm. stretch? Or... Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Right. Okay. Uh, so I was I was expecting Loz to go right. And okay, you need to stretch. You, it's been an hour. You need to <laughs> <laughs> tell us off. Okay. So uh, let me just make a quick note of the time. Again, people live broadcast. You're seeing behind the scenes here. No pretense. This is what happens. Okay. So um, we're going to go straight in on one of your answers. Um, I think I started with Laura on the last episode. So Carl, I'm going to start with you. So my first question is focused on the impact of professional relationships on your career to date. Now, obviously, we've covered a lot of that uh, over the course of the podcast we've talked about. But away from that area of conflict, where have your relationships had the biggest impact on you so far? Um, I think for me, relationships is something that... Um... Let me just start again. I mean, I, I'm a natural introvert. I've been an introvert for the past 20 years. Every time I take a, a, an MBTI test or any kind of behavior profile, I come out as an introvert. Uh, and I used to see that as a weakness, but I now see that as a strength. I recognize that for the strength that it is. Because what it means is that um, when I work in small groups or on a one-to-one, -one, what I tend to do is build deep relationships. So. And the people that I connect with tend to be connected with me on a values level. So it's no wonder that you know Laura, Laura knows you, and I know both of you. 
uh, or you know you met uh, surveyor the other day and uh, i was like yeah. oh wow you know it's no wonder that i live in this very small connected world because the people i connect with tend to be really good people who align with my values so i've always done that andy i've always connected with people from a value first perspective um, i have this phrase that uh, that i use that says uh, understand or know like-minded people but only connect or work with like valued people and it's a, such a strong faith phrase for me and it has seen me through so much so professional relationships for me whether that is me having a relationship with colleagues in the police service or me developing relationships with external partners stakeholders outside of the police service in terms of the strategic partnership or even now me developing relationships with the corporate clients that I work with now the reason why I keep getting repeat custom is because my cust my, my relationship is a deep relationship and I, I put a lot of value on getting good relationships around me you know you and I might not talk for a year or two but when we do talk I want to make sure that conversation is a good conversation that we have and same with Laura that's sort of my perspective on their relationships I, I love that um, connection on values-based relationships mm -hmm. because that's where you find rapport, when you, you you see the world in the same way. Now, you've got to balance that with what you were saying on the Monday podcast about having that cognitive diversity. Um, yeah. But I think you can have cognitive diversity with the same values. 100%. I think they're so different things. When I talk about it in the context of uh, organisations, I'll say to people, you need to have somebody brought into your organization that is going to work in alignment with your core values as an organization. But that doesn't mean they have to think the same way. They, have, they just have to have share the same values. So sharing the same values doesn't mean they share the same thoughts. There's a, that's why I differentiate between like-minded and like-valued. Values for me is much, much deeper than the thoughts that we have. Great stuff. Laura, I was going to say follow that. Uh, so so <laughs> the, the, the impact on relationships on your career or, or even if you just want to build on what Cole's just saying, I'm happy um, either way. I mean, for my career, my career is based around helping people um, with their confidence and with their health and with their well-being. And very much for me, relationships are the core foundation of our business. And when mm -hmm. we uh, work with people and coach people, and the way that I approach that is I approach it very much as how I used to approach it when I was in the police or when I would do um, an interview with a suspect or whatever. And that sounds really awful. Um, no, I, I am simply curious and I get down to their level. And I don't mean to say that in a derogatory way, but I will meet them where they are and build that relationship with them so that they feel like they're heard um, because the people that come into our world have been through so many different things with their bodies and their emotions and their mental health. And nine times out of ten, they're just a number on a program. And for us, it's very much about being able to be natural with our guys so that they feel that they are heard. And that, for me, is how I build relationships. And it's exactly, I always tell my clients, I kind of question you like I would do when I'm in the police in terms of getting all the information, doing that level three listening, where you're really listening, but you're looking for the bits in between to then ask them, you know, questions back. Uh, very much so. Well, that does explain why when I was doing the Rock Solid program, you kept asking me what I was doing at 3 p.m. last Sunday. Uh, <laughs> and to explain my explain exactly who could uh, st uh, testify to that. Um, <laughs> so we've talked a lot on the Monday podcast about conflict I internally and, and in your role in the police. Um, our second question is always about where relationships have gone wrong. So it would be interesting to get a perspective that takes us away from the conversation we've already had on the Monday podcast and, and where else um, that's really impacted you and, and what you learned from it. So, Laura, can I come to you on this one, first of all? Yeah, I think I'm just making a few notes on that. This actually, and I've seen a few colleagues in our uh, industry who have this um, opinion that if I could do it, you can. What's the matter with you? Yeah. And very judgmental 
right? Yeah. Um, we all have limitations, and I don't mean to say that in a disempowering way, but you've got to work with somebody within their limitations to build up the confidence to be able to do that. Just because I can run up and down the stairs doesn't mean to say one of my clients can. And you cannot be judgmental, and I often find that very much within our space. It's very much ego-driven. Well, if I can do it, you can do it, and we're judgmental. And I just think that's totally the wrong way to go about building relationships with people. Great stuff. And Carl, how about from you? Um, I think, you know, the, the question is such a wide question in the sense that, you know, we can really pick on any area of our lives. And one of the things that comes to my mind straight away, and we haven't explored it, is relationships in terms of romantic relationships. And having been through divorce myself, um, I would challenge anyone who's been through that experience and not, not thought about what they could have done better. Uh, and, you know, relationships fail for pretty much the same reasons. They will fail because there's a lack of trust. They will fail because there's a lack of communication. They will fail because there's a lack of understanding or fail because there's a lack of empathy. Those are fundamentally the reasons why any relationship fails, whether it's marriage, whether it's a professional relationship, customer client relationship, any relationship will fail if those four issues are not there. So for me, all the failed relationships I have, whether it's divorce or whether it is uh, uh, relationships that I didn't, I just couldn't grip hold of in the police service, you know, people that I just couldn't get on well with, uh, or people or clients even uh, who have uh, I've had a difficult time with. I always try to analyze which one of those four areas did I fail on or did I fail? Could I have done anything better? Or could they have done something better as well? There was clearly a disconnect. And then I wonder why there was a disconnect. Is it because I was working with the wrong person? Is it because our values weren't aligned? Uh, so it always comes back down to the whole values thing for me. And if our values weren't aligned, then probably we were never going to really get on to the extent that we're going to be performing at a high level as a team, as a partnership, as a couple or whatever it might be. Just a quick break. There's a background noise. Can you guys hear that as well? Yeah, I heard that. It's coming? gone now. Oh no, uh, it's come back. Still there. It's not nothing that either of you recognise around you. You haven't got one of those little toys on your desk that you got free at McDonald's that go up and down. Um, let's Andy try and McDonald's from let... me. <laughs> let's. Uh, no, that would be that would be Baz. Uh, let, let's let's try and, and crack on and, and hopefully. I'm not sure what we can do about that. Um, we'll, we'll work our best. Hopefully it's not too distracting for people. Um, this week's podcast, uh, the week we're recording this, so the one that came out on the 18th of October is with Neil Wilkie. And Neil um, looked, he left his corporate role and started looking at personal relationships. Uh, and he studied psychotherapy and took what he learnt and created a relationship paradigm with I think it was six key areas. Um, and now he's he's looking at that from a professional relationship perspective as well. So very simple, similar thinking culture mm -hmm. to where you are. I'm a bit worried about this um, sound. So what I'm gonna do, uh, with apologies to everyone tuned in, I'm gonna end the live broadcast. And if it's okay, I'm gonna invite you both onto a Zoom call just to finish it off. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, we'll, we'll sort that out. So let me end up, if you guys stay there, um, I'm going to end the live broadcast because of that noise. I think it's too distracting to continue a recording and we'll finish the rest just off. So for everyone who's joined us, apologies for the abrupt end and hopefully you understand. Thank you for all your comments. Wendy Kitson, thank you for your thank you. Um, and uh, and it stopped. There you go. It stops, it? There we go. The the, the 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 little jumping toy has run out of it's been wound down. Oh. It has. Oh. Okay, let's try and crack on. Are you still with us, everyone? <laughs> so like, yes, you are. I can see you still are. Fantastic. Okay, so let me just um go back to for an edit note, David, who's our wonderful uh e editor. Um I'll go from the end of Cole's answer, just my response there, uh, for the edit point. Um, so Neil Wilkie, who was um, a guest on the 18th of October, um, he t he has created a relationship paradigm. So he had quit his successful role. He um, he studied psychotherapy, I think it was, uh, and he then 
explored personal relationships. And he's come up with, I think it's six areas in a relationship paradigm. So very similar to, to you, Carl, that, that uh, encapsulate what a successful relationship is. And we explored that with a view to, to professional relationships. So that might be a useful resource in terms... I'm giving you lots of further listening here. That might be a, future, uh, a further resource to look at that. Talking about further resources takes me very smoothly on to our third and final question, and that is the resources that you swear by. Um, so these might be books, podcasts, uh, it, it can be um, TED Talks, anything along those lines, either that have had a big impact on you in your business or your career, or that you've read or listened to, engaged with recently that have really stood out for you. What we're just trying to do, uh, the listeners of this show are the type of people that enjoy consuming information in its various forms that, that help them grow and understand the world around them and how to be more successful. Um, and our guests are people that can suggest resources. So, Carl, let's start with you. What do you have to offer? Um, well, I, I'm going to talk about two people who have, amongst many, but these two, I would say, of in, in over the last few years have really shaped where I'm coming from when it comes to leadership and emotional intelligence. Uh, I'm passionate about the area, but um, I needed to learn more depth. Uh, and Simon Sinek, uh, I think, is like one of the best leadership speakers out there, leadership authors out there. The stuff that he does around understanding your why, uh, understanding uh, the, the, uh, the values of leadership, I think, are second to none. Second to none. So I would absolutely recommend that uh, you listen to him on YouTube, get grab hold of his books because uh, he, he will capture your attention, no doubt, and you'll learn a lot from him. The second person um, who I only came across him uh, last year, I think it was, during lockdown, but I've been absolutely uh, infatuated by his thinking ever since, is Matthew Syed. So Matthew Syed has written two uh, really good books. He's actually written, I think, three books, but... Uh, Two really good books that uh, I, I've, I've devoured. Uh, one is called Rebel Ideas. So Rebel Ideas is very much around the concept that I'm talking about when it comes to diversity, something that I've always believed in, but it's the way that Matthew Syed pulls it together that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, it's, this is a conflict and the challenge between demographic diversity and cognitive diversity. It is about understanding what echo chambers are, how echo chambers are created and therefore how they can be broken. And the other phenomenal book that he's got, which is again another another great book and something I've always believed in is Black Box Thinking. Black Box Thinking is really about how do you shape the culture of your organization? I know in the police service, and Laura, they probably did it in your police force as well, uh, where they used to say, oh, we're going to not have a, a blame culture. We're going to move away from the blame culture. So every time somebody made a mistake in, in the police service, the, the idea was that we'd learn from that mistake. The reality of it was that the professional standards departments that we had, the you know the internal investigation departments uh, that we had in, in the forces actually grew in number. And uh, certainly in my old force, we were uh, one of the biggest, we had one of the biggest professional standards departments in the country. And some of the bigger forces, even some of the bigger forces had smaller PSD departments than we did. So consequently, what you had was everybody in the organization was frightened of making mistakes. Everybody was frightened and looking over their shoulder, thinking, am I going to am I going to get called up by the professional standards departments, discipline, et cetera, et cetera. Particularly in the ages of austerity from 2008 onwards, where people were worried about losing their jobs, but they're also worried about do, doing something wrong because so consequently your performance starts, starts dropping. So Matthew Syed in his book about black box thinking is all about how we can create a learning culture where we can genuinely learn from mistakes and prevent them from happening and look for the black box because that's what the air industry do. The first thing the air industry will do at a plane crash is not look to blame people, is look for the orange box, it's actually an orange box, not a black box, to say, well, what were the what were the what happened in the final few seconds and can we learn from that and can we stop this happening immediately from here on in? So those are my recommendations. Those are great. And, and Simon Sinek is a regular in this slot on the podcast. Our oh, little, is he? Yeah. And, and so, is, uh, so is Rebel Ideas from me because I go on about it all the time. Um, I think it's an absolutely brilliant book. 
I can I hear our think like me with values or something. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I can hear our choppy toy start again very faintly in the background. So, Laura, tell me your resources. Let's see if we can get through it before I'll go the, the noise ramps up. That's fine. So, you might not have had these books mentioned before because, Andy, you know I love a bit of woo. Oh, you do. <laughs> I have a podcast guest for you, but we'll sort okay. that out afterwards. Okay, all right. Two podcasts. Number one, Lucas Rockwood Show. Lucas Rockwood is a yoga teacher and he has really engaged conversations with lots of people about health and well-being, um, ranging from sleep to magnesium to, you know, sexual problems, all that kind of stuff. It's brilliant. Um, the next one would be Whoop, which Whoop is a company. Um, we have their bands. And again, they talk very much about your performance. Uh, they used to deal a lot with athletes, but they've very much now gone into dealing with CEOs and organizations and how managing your energy can actually really boost your productivity. Do you that, want me to keep going? Yeah, please, please uh, keep going. Okay. Um, so they're the two podcasts that I would absolutely recommend. Um, and then I have two books. Number one, The Magic by Rhonda Byrne. Okay. Yeah. And it's a 28-day kind of challenge and it is based around the principle of gratitude and having the attitude of gratitude and I very much believe that we are being brought up now in a society which is in scarcity and lack and loss and never and I feel by being able to read these kind of books and implement these kind of things from um, the magic it really does help to lift your life see things from a different perspective and when you look at, you know, things in a different way, those things change for you. All right. So it's very powerful, very simple things you can do. And then the last one would be Dr. Wayne Dyer, um, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, and his book is um, The Power of Intention, which is really important because a lot of us will take action every day, whether it is, you know, going to a meeting or writing social media posts. And we tend to just do it. But what I loved about that book and Wayne Dyer, he talks about your intention behind it. You know, what is the intention that you're going into that meeting with? What is the intention behind connecting with that person? And I just found them so impactful for me that they would absolutely have to be my my four things to pass on. Fantastic. Thank you both. Our choppy toy has stopped for a moment so we can have a relaxed close to the event. It sounds like... Um... Simon Sinek and Wayne Dyer may well be coming from very similar um, yes. schools of thought in, in the way that they approach things. And it's a very powerful uh, approach as well. Carl and Laura, thank you very much for joining me. Two really engaging, really interesting and very insightful conversations. And I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. So thank you very much to Cole and to Laura and thank you for your comments and thank you for bearing with us through all of that strange noise at the end. I don't know if you heard it as well. Lots of great comments. I, I hope I managed to mention uh, uh, most of you and most of them. Um, hopefully we'll have a couple more live broadcasts uh, between now and the end of the year. The, um, the podcast itself we will take a break from the second week in December uh, till the new year but we may well still be recording interviews for New Year publication at that time. So keep your eyes posted on LinkedIn, Facebook and YouTube for more podcasts. Uh, but thank you very much in the meantime for joining us on the Connected Leadership Podcast live. <laughs>